1986, the Alaska Board of Fisheries established a quota on the number of king salmon caught by Cook Inlet's east side set netters. This decision may or may not stand, but what about future decisions to further restrict the east side set netters? Why are these decisions being made? And how could they impact the people in this commercial fishery? And who are the set netters? This is their story. It's a challenge at times. Uh, you want to be good, and I fish probably as good as anybody around here. And a lot of confidence in what I do. And go out there and fight the weather and fight the elements, and usually you win, and sometimes you have to back off. But there seems to be a movement afoot nowadays to uh, close this type of fishery out and uh, give the fish to the sportsman. <laughs> and I, I'm having a hard time with that. I don't know, I, I just don't feel like that it's, that, uh, it's not the American way. We have a way of life here that we've worked for, and uh, we've built it up. And, uh, I suppose it would be likened to the farmer's plight. You know, they've had their farms for generations in their family, and to all of a sudden be faced with losing that is pretty hard to swallow. For over a hundred years, they have fought the sea. For generations, they have fought the weather. It's a legacy rich in tradition, and strong in conviction. They are the east side set netters of Cook Inlet, and today they are facing perhaps their greatest fight. And for many of them, this could be the last harvest. On the beaches of Cook Inlet, families have built an industry and a way of life. They're called set netters. Set netters are commercial fishermen who set their nets near the beaches. They don't drift or move in a boat to capture the fish. They set their nets where experience tells them the fish will be running. Up and down the beach, each set netter has evolved his or her own way of fishing, depending on the terrain. Some sites rely heavily on a beach net that is strung from the high tide line out to a buoy near low tide. While others depend more on offshore sets, some as far out as a mile and a half. The nets are strung between buoys from a small skiff. This can be quite a challenge in the powerful current of Cook Inlet, which has some of the highest tides in the world. Usually the nets are picked or the fish are removed right before slack tide when the current is low but still strong enough to keep the fish from falling out of the nets. The high and low tides come every six hours, leaving very little time for sleep. Maybe a couple of hours at night and a short nap during the day. Between tides, there's always a lot to do. Nets must be mended, gear cleaned and repaired, and the fish taken to the processor. All in preparation for the next tide, which is now just a couple of hours away. This definitely is not a job for someone who must have their eight hours of sleep every day. In commercial fishing, when the fish are in, you fish. Almost every fish site is a family operation. And with that comes support. It's hard. It's hard mentally, it's hard physically, and uh, it's not a real picnic down there. But that's another thing that is is a plus with the family situation because you're down there with people that love you and that you love and if you get cranky and yell at them everybody's gonna understand and they'll still love you tomorrow. I first looked over this beach here June of 1961 and we have been here ever since. I've never been sorry from the day I got here. The kids were all pretty young when they first started uh, 
we all just kind of grew up every summer here on the fish site together. And as the kids got older and uh, got into college, they all worked their way through college right here. They made their college tuition and uh, a lot of their friends came with them. When I go down to this beach in the morning to fish, I have the little grandkids, the middle grandkids, and the older grandkids. And they, all three generations are down there working together, pulling together, fishing together. I think there's very few people that ever have this privilege nowadays. We used to in the old days in the farms and whatnot, but nowadays we don't have that privilege. I have two sisters, and all of us went to the same college. And uh, when we met the men we felt were our prospective husbands, although this wasn't planned, it wasn't premeditated, it just worked out that all of the guys spent a summer here on the beach, working on the beach, before we were married, kind of like a proving ground. The three girls went off to college, and uh, while they were there, they uh, met these young fellows that were working their way through college, and uh, they called up me and said, Dad, there's a nice looking fellow over here that uh, kind of like to work with us this summer. I have often wondered what would have happened if one of them had not liked fishing, hadn't enjoyed fishing, say if, if my husband just hated fishing and didn't want to be involved in it at all. Well, what would I have done? It was that important to me. Well, with three daughters and three summers, I ended up with three son-in-laws. One of those son-in-laws is also a songwriter. I wish Wish that I could catch a fish I wish, wish that I could catch a fish I've been working all morning with those running lines And I just keep getting farther behind I wish, I wish that I could catch a fish up nets and anchors all day but I just have to sit around and say I wish I wish that I could catch a fish I wish I wish that I could catch a fish I got outside sets and beach nets too but I'm still feeling pretty blue I wish, wish that I could catch a fish I wish, wish that I could catch a fish Some tides bring no fish, some tides bring a bounty I wish I could catch a fish, just one Even if it's just a little hooligan Up until the peak of the run hits, picking is slim A fisherman can make or break his season in a matter of days or in a few short hours. There are fishermen, and then there are fishermen. And the guys that are fishermen are gamblers. There's no other way to put it other than they are gamblers because it narrows down to just a few hours and a few days that we have a chance to get at those fish. And you don't know whether the water is going to be rough uh, whether it's going to be storming, uh, whether you'll be able to get your nets in the water or not, and you'll stand here and think, man, I've got a whole, a whole year's living wrapped up in the next few hours here. And if that's not gambling, then I mean, it's, it's a gamble. I started fishing when I was 14 years old, and I'm now 66, so you figure up what we got. It's over 50 years in the fishery. Herman Hermanson was born in Kenai. He and his brothers have been set netting on the east side of Cook Inlet all their lives, following in the footsteps of their parents and grandparents. I just love fishing. That's all there was here. When I was born and raised, that's all there was to do was fish. If you didn't fish, you didn't make it. There was nothing else. Well, my mother, she's the oldest person alive out of Kenai today. She's 88 years old. And uh, her, uh, her folks used to work in the salmon business themselves. In fact, my, my grandfather used to make nets for the canneries when my mother was a little girl, so yeah, that was long before the traps and uh, we had uh, drifters in the inlet. Today, commercial fishing is the second most important industry on the Kenai Peninsula. 
second only to oil. It's responsible for 20% of the total economy of the peninsula and affects more families directly than any other industry. Over the last five years, set netting has generated over $175 million and currently employs approximately 1,500 people. Although the commercial salmon fishing season is limited to one and a half months in the summer, its economic impact extends well beyond that. Many months of work go into preparing for the season, because once it starts, there's little time for anything else. Buildings must be constructed, boats built or repaired, motors bought or rebuilt and tested. Trucks, tractors, nets, all must be readied. The result is a stable year-round economic boost for the Kenai Peninsula. Almost every business in the area depends on the commercial fishery for survival. In the summer, tourism is a welcomed addition to the economy. But the business people must have the income provided by the commercial fishermen who live there year-round. Right now, the commercial fishing is the most important thing they got going on this peninsula. It's what's holding it up because oil's down. They're taking, uh, just guessing, direct to the fishermen. I'm guessing, but it should be somewhere around between 40 and 60 million dollars and a lot of it stays here. The demand for salmon is large and growing. It is shipped around the world fresh frozen and canned. Handling fresh seafood takes discipline and dedication. We really need to have a good product to a sellable product because we're competing with other seafoods and so therefore we try very hard to keep our product fresh. And uh, my crew is instructed to do whatever they can to try to maintain this freshness. We recognize that we need a fresh product because that's what fish is all about. It would seem natural that this would be the end of the story and everybody lives happily ever after. But this is where the story takes a different turn. The problem starts with the habits of the salmon themselves. King salmon swim with the red salmon, which are targeted by the commercial fishermen. This results in what's called an incidental catch of king salmon. There is no known way to catch red salmon without catching kings. This is what gives rise to the controversy. Over the last few years, sport fishing on the Kenai River has increased dramatically because it's a river that is easily accessible from Anchorage. When the kings are in the river, the competition is stiff. Separated by only a few feet, boat after boat drifts through the productive fishing holes trying to hook a trophy king salmon. Since guiding has become a business on the Kenai River, a dispute has brewed over who should have access to the king salmon. In 1977, the commercial fishermen agreed not to fish until around July 1st in order to allow the first run of Kenai kings through. They also agreed to stop fishing in the middle of August to increase the number of silver salmon available to the sport fishermen. This worked for the commercial fishermen because it meant they didn't miss the peak of the red salmon run. In 1978, these commercial fishermen voted to voluntarily assess themselves 2% of their gross to be put towards aquaculture. Since then, nearly $5 million has been raised. This money has been used for habitat enhancement programs and fish hatcheries that have benefited sport fishermen and commercial fishermen alike. This is Crooked Creek Hatchery in Kasilov. Here, king salmon, red salmon, coho salmon and steelhead are raised and then released in streams throughout the Kenai Peninsula. Well, basically we're producing fish for, uh, for a couple of user groups, both, both the sport and the commercial fishermen out here in Cook Inlet and uh, the peninsula streams. Uh, for instance, uh, the Chinook salmon fishery that we have uh, basically created down at the mouth of Crooked Creek, uh, Kasilov River, uh, traditionally that run was fairly small. We, uh, we started taking eggs out of it, uh, well it's been almost 10 years ago now and uh, we built that run up to 
Oh, it was uh, approximately 10, between 10 and 12,000 12, adults last season. About 9,000 approximately were caught in the sport fishery down here, making it a fairly substantial Chinook salmon fishery uh, uh, ranking way higher than a lot of the other streams in the area. We're in the process of building a steelhead uh, fishery down there now. We have our first returning uh, steelhead adults uh, coming back into the system this year, which will make for some exciting fishing. But in 1986, politics once more entered the fishery in Cook Inlet. The Kenai River Sport Fishing Association brought the controversy to a head by submitting a proposal to the Alaska Board of Fisheries, now known as Proposal Number 219. The proposal asked that the salmon resource be managed primarily for the sport fishery. This would effectively do away with the Cook Inlet Management Plan. It also called for a mandatory shutdown of the east side set netters once 7,000 king salmon were caught. This would effectively cut out the heart of the already short commercial fishing season, the time historically when the red salmon run hits its peak. What would be the potential gain to the sport fishery if something like Proposal 219 implement? Using the average over the last six years, this decision would allow approximately 2,414 more kings to reach the river, according to Fish and Games data. At the current sport catch ratio of about 11%, that means only 265 more kings could be potentially caught by sport fishermen. But at what expense? If 219 would go into effect this year, Fish and Game predicts up to 1 million red salmon will be lost to commercial fishermen in Cook Inlet. That translates into a direct $9 million loss to the industry. When standard economic multipliers are figured in, some estimates show the total economic impact on the Kenai Peninsula could be up to $45 million. No less than one half of the East Side Setnetter families would lose everything they have worked for, their houses, their businesses, and forced into bankruptcy. On other sites, there would be about a 50% reduction in their crews, which means a loss of approximately 750 jobs. Before this 219 came down in the board hearings, we already had online and on contract to expansion to this plant. And if I would have had any idea that this was going to happen, I sure wouldn't have spent this money because it sure wouldn't warrant it if they take, it, if they take that amount of fish away from us. If you took a million salmon out of this sockeye run down here, there would probably be three or four processors go broke, and there'd be three or four hundred people that wouldn't have a job in the summertime for a period of probably 60 days. Well, that would mean that we'd have a, we already have a high unemployment situation here at the present time, it's about 17 and a half percent. Uh, it would mean there'd be a lot more people unemployed, there'd be a lot less, uh, the economy would go way down, there'd be a lot less jobs, there'd be less houses built, there would be less um, uh, construction activity, there'd be less money to pay our bonded indebtedness as far as the borough itself is concerned, which would mean perhaps a higher tax rate even occurring. Fishing is a way of life, it's the only way of life that many of our people know, and the fishermen, um, would really be hurting, uh, and that would hurt our community, it would hurt our whole area. It's a situation where it would be just like closing an industry does to other towns. It uh, puts people out of work, puts them on the street, gives them a sense of hopelessness. I think it would be a terrible thing. The basic question here is how healthy is the fishery in Cook Inlet? The Soldatna headquarters of the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. Our tagging data, we certainly do have king salmon entering the river, the catch per unit effort is at a record, at least for this segment of the run. Just how long it's going to stay up there, we're not quite sure. At a passage rate of about 3,000 fish per index points, we're estimating a total return of sockeye salmon to the inlet of 4.8 to 5.6 million fish. Well, in general, the Kenai River stocks are, are probably at an all-time high. The sockeye runs to the Kenai, without question, are, are the highest we've ever seen. And we have data that goes back over 100 years and the commercial fishery, and there's no question that our sockeye stocks are at an all-time high. The database for king salmon is considerably shorter, however the indications are that they too are, are also at, at uh, extremely high levels, and that, that applies right down the line with virtually all stocks. Uh, coho salmon runs appear to be extremely strong. Pink salmon runs are not at record levels, but they are certainly healthy. Uh, no indication at this point that we have a resource problem with, with any salmon stock in the Kenai River. 
Despite testimony from the Department of Fish and Game biologists stating there was no need for Proposal 219 because the king salmon stocks were in extremely good shape, and after further testimony on the potential economic and human impact, the Board of Fisheries voted 4-3 to three in favor of Proposal 219. A few days later, after rumors of scandal and trading votes couldn't be defused, the 1986-87 Board of Fisheries ceased its work without finishing, and as one Anchorage newspaper put it, adjourned in turmoil. So with the salmon resource being healthier than ever, and the board process apparently not working properly, it becomes easier to understand the set netters' fear and frustration. And I'm sure that there'll be plenty of sport fish for everybody. And we don't have no, no quarrels with the sport fishermen. Like I say, everybody is a potential sportsman as far as I'm concerned, so. Um, I, I have to weigh it against losing uh, a whole generation of you know, what we've built here and, and not having what I experienced for myself for my children. And so, I, you know, it makes me sad and I don't really know how to fight it. Uh, because I don't feel that most people understand the uh, the question here. It's not it's not just that we're we're not down here playing. We're not down here recreating. Uh, to a lot of it, it's it's our sole income. And um, a man came here one time with money in hand and wanted to buy my fish site. And it was it was tempting because it was a good price and I could retire myself. But for me to take the money and retire, that put all my grandkids out of work, shall we say. All these uh, children out of work and whatnot. And, and to me, it was not worth it. Money could not buy this way of life. And so I said to the man, no, I like my way of life and I'm gonna stay with it so it's no sale. Well, my daddy came over from Norway in 1923 to Washington. In 1924, he came up and was working on the fish traps for Libby McNeil Libby, which is now the Columbia Ward Cannery in Kenai. 1939, he started set netting here. And set netted here from 39 until passed away in 1978. So he got uh, quite a few years in here. I'm sure the reason he liked this place because it had the nicest place to camp on the whole beach and that was more important uh, in those days than fishing. It had running water and got protected and they got a little cove gully in here so you're protected from the wind and uh, I'm sure that's why he liked this spot and that's why he ended up buying I think at the time he bought it for $200 which was a lot of money in those days. He did well most of the years, raised five kids here and cooked a lot of pancakes and mostly good times. I think my dad set an example of honesty. He wouldn't cheat anybody. And if anybody's going to be cheated, he'd cheat himself. Always willing to help a neighbor. He always had new fishermen coming around and, and ask uh, how something was done. And he would never hesitate and always willing to help. And he's a hard working man. And right up till the day he died. No, he's left a lot of memories here. And I see the hassle between the sports fishermen and the uh, commercial fishermen, and I'm afraid that we are, number one, outnumbered. And they don't want us at all. They want it all for them. And I won't buy that, and I won't stand still for it. So. And without this fishery, we would be really out of luck and I really don't believe that the people of the state of Alaska or the people in Anchorage or on the peninsula or any place else for that matter in the state of Alaska would really like to see this fishery shut down. I don't believe that they, I don't really, in my heart, I don't believe that they would really stand for this. Commercial fishermen uh, were here historically. They've given up weight. I think the time has come that it really should be turned around. It isn't a matter of conservation. We still have, we are having bigger runs than we've ever had. There's more fish than there's ever been. And I think it is not time to be cutting out 
the commercial fishing. Well, if there were no commercial fishing, if we were shut down tomorrow, outside of the fact that it would affect us monetarily, um, it would also affect us, uh, our family. We wouldn't have that thing that draws us together every year. I'm not talking about just my husband and children, but my sisters, my brother, his wife, their children. We wouldn't have that thing that draws us together every summer. And uh, that would certainly be a great loss to me. And uh, I'm sure everyone in the family feels that way. In the morning, fifth hour, I've checked the tides and I've checked the time and I head on down to the shoreline. Two tractors are running fine, three dories are sitting in the sand. We're fishing ten nets, we're the set net fishermen. We've got good men on the beach, we've got good men in the water. Good fishermen married to the fisherman's daughters. Harvest time is here again. Harvest time is here again. See the water so beautiful. See the mountains across the sea. There is no other place I'd rather be. A fisherman's hands are leather-like. His mind is keen and his heart is strong. If it's a good year, that's nice, but if not, he'll get along. The winter season is such a long time, but next year we'll do it again. Doing the things we learn from when the fishermen. Harvest time is here again. Harvest time is here and gone. In the summer of 1986, one average red salmon was worth nine dollars, about the same as a barrel of oil. Proposal 219 may or may not stand, but what new restrictions will the future bring? It's time we acknowledge the importance of commercial fishing in Alaska and stand beside the men and women who have built this most valuable renewable resource industry. They need our help and support to prevent this from being their last harvest.